And so the research that I'm presenting attempts to address both tenant energy poverty and the split incentive problem through policy and program mechanisms. Um, this was the research question. Um, so what policies, regulations, or programs are effective at increasing rental housing, energy efficiency, climate resilience, and tenant justice? Um, it occurred using three different methods. So uh, literature, literature review and desktop research, interviews with stakeholders to gain more context, and then a policy and regulation comparison to make sure that the policies that we are recommending and implementing are actually appropriate for the BC context. So there are three types of analysis criteria that were considered in this policy comparison phase, equity, effectiveness, and feasibility. So equity concerning tenant justice included reviewing initiatives for procedural, structural, distributive, and transgenerational equity. Um, these are big terms, but in other words, were tenants involved in the process? Does the initiative address and try and fix the structural imbalances between tenants and landlords? Are benefits and burdens distributed equally between tenants and landlords? And do benefits apply to future generations? The effectiveness criteria analyzed whether programs actually reached their goals regarding energy efficiency, housing stability, climate resilience, and safety. And in this research, housing stability includes both housing affordability and security of tenancy. Um, the last criteria, feasibility, uh, reviewed um, whether or not there was support on a political level um, for an initiative, and also on a technical level, what resources are needed to implement it, and if the initiative had been done before in BC or Canada. So, um, what's going on in BC? So most of the energy efficiency programs, um, as Margot mentioned, target and benefit homeowner, homeowners, and most policies and programs don't involve tenants or give them rights to energy efficient or climate resilient housing. However, there are some upcoming initiatives that can help tenants, such as the alterations code, um, the implementation of Vancouver's greenhouse gas and energy limits bylaw, and there are some changes to the Residential Tenancy Act to help limit rent evictions, which definitely do benefit tenants. So, um, looking at other jurisdictions, the most effective policies and programs to help increase tenants' rights to energy efficient, climate resilient, and safe housing had four elements in common. So they are mandatory, they involve performance standards, they had robust enforcement mechanisms, and they target the building unit. A lot of the voluntary initiatives that I looked at seem to fail because of a lack of uptake or lack of consistent uptake. Now, performance standards, um, I'll do like a little bit of definition just so everyone knows uh, what I'm talking about. So performance standards differ, differ from minimum building standards or prescriptive standards. Prescriptive standards, like a building code, talk about what specific elements need that are needed to install in a home to maintain a minimum level of livability, such as um, insulation or a type of window or a specific installation process. On the other hand, performance standards rely on meeting a specific energy performance criteria or a performance score. So this criteria can be met with a number of different design strategies. Um, and they tend to have like a clear pass-fail rating rather than an inspection system to see what actual things have been installed, which um, can be insufficient or have loopholes. So the third effective strategy is tar oh. the third effective strategy is in robust enforcement mechanisms such as um, giving fines to people who don't comply or not giving a residential uh, tenancy permit because the rental unit didn't meet any performance standards. The fourth and last effective strategy is targeting analysis for energy or climate resilience on the building unit scale versus the entire building scale. So for example, in London, their supplementary housing guidance standards target the building unit level. So they look at each individual unit and how energy efficient or climate resilient is to extreme heat. So this means that each individual unit is, um, can be designed to meet energy efficient and climate resilient standards. On the other hand, if you look at energy efficiency and climate resiliency on an entire building level, 
quite often what can happen is that there are some really efficient units that overcompensate for inefficient units in other areas. And this can help, or this doesn't help, but it can entrench inequities in housing further if you have this dichotomy of efficiency and inefficiency in the same building that is efficient um, by all standards. So that was the preamble. <laughs> so from all of this, I have seven different recommendations for policymakers or seven diff different recommendations for you to consider. Um, and this, yeah, so this includes four foundational initiatives and three policy program pathways. And you'll understand the difference in a moment. So the foundational initiatives help quantify BC's private rental housing stock and can also help ensure the future readiness of existing buildings. The first one is to make a provincial housing registry um, because right now we can guesstimate how much rental housing is out there and where it is. Um, so this will help quantify rental housing stock and later on this same platform can be used to track other dimensions related to housing such as energy efficiency, um, maybe rental prices, um, and can also help qualify what these different rental units look like in terms of upkeep and climate resilience. So this system can involve coordination with municipalities because you can implement them in different ways. Um, Montreal, I'm not sure if you're aware, has just implemented their own landlord registry, so that's something we can look towards. Um, but this could be implemented using rental housing business license information or like a tenant reporting system. But I personally recommend that it be a mandatory system to sign up for it and that it's a public housing registry so that we have more information on rental housing and the general public does as well. So the second foundation, foundational initiative is rental energy disclosure requirements. And this is a practice in many US states and one that can, I think, be easily inserted into a Residential Tenancy Act amendment. So rental energy disclosure clauses require that a landlord or utility provide a prospective tenant with 12 months of energy use and cost data when requested. So this increases distributional equity of information and transparency, and there is an opportunity to have further collaboration with utility and make it so that energy disclosures are available for all potential households, regardless of tenure type. So the third initiative is to mandate using future climate files for energy audits. Um, and so these processes, for those who are unaware, are conducted to determine energy efficiency of a building. And this is important, this is an important point, because right now, um, the audits that are done are using historical data sets, which means that an energy efficient house today may not be as energy efficient in 5, 10, 15, 20 years over the life cycle of the building. So using, using future climate files in this analysis will make it so that these terminations are more future ready and the housing that is made and retrofitted is more resilient in the long term. And I think this initiative is the easiest to implement, kind of the low hanging fruit of this entire presentation um, because there are future climate files available. The work just needs to happen to um, talk with the federal government and integrate it so that it is compatible with the different audit systems like HOT 2000. So the last foundational initiative is to create a labeling system for energy efficiency and climate adaptation. I know that this has been mentioned in the Clean BC Roadmap to 2030 and I'm emphasizing that this is a good step. Um, so this creates more um, equity, distributional equity of information and helps people compare energy efficiency and climate resiliency between different housing units. Um, having two separate labeling systems um, is a suggestion to help jumpstart the process because there are energy efficiency labeling systems out there. So the one on the slide is from the UK and I could go on their website, type in any address and this pops up and tells me how energy efficient it is. Um, so we can use that as an example for how to implement that in BC. Um, and then climate adaptation labeling can later develop in stages based on climate hazard and um, can be used to review um, provincial progress on meeting energy efficiency and climate adaptation goals. 
Um, so additionally, it's a province-wide system, but there is room to develop work plans for municipalities to um, create their own test systems. So those are the foundational initiatives. So from that, those initiatives I think should be done regardless of whatever happens next. But there are three foundational initiatives that can be done concurrently or separately, um, but they're designed to incentivize rental housing retrofits in ways that do not burden tenants with the costs of these retrofits. Um, these initiatives aim for low or no cost retrofit schemes by offering an energy efficiency support program to landlords that includes an affordability covenant to provide an avenue for retrofitting without raising rents. So this support program also increases um, procedural equity because it mandates tenant involvement through like a, um, a clause which requires that whatever work is done on a rental unit, you have to involve the tenant in um, the planning process to one, ensure that what you are doing is actually effective and two, make it so that um, they can continue living there and have um, be able to benefit from these changes. So each of the policy program pathways includes the retrofit support program, but they, bet they differ in the way that they deal with the specific policy changes. So the first pathway is through making additions to the alterations code, which is being um, prepared through the existing buildings and renewal strategy. So this up and coming building code for existing buildings um, should include specific requirements um, like specifying filters and filters for ventilation systems and maximum and minimum interior temperatures, like guaranteeing a right to cool or right to, yeah, right to cooling. Um, but also should involve specific processes such as looking, looking at climate resilience and energy efficiency on a per unit scale and including performance evaluation me measures rather than just prescriptive design criteria. There are strengths and weaknesses of all of these pathways. Um, the one for most of them is that it increases um, equity across the province. Right now, there is kind of a patchwork system where actually some tenants in some municipalities have more rights to heating than in other municipalities, depending on what's written in standard of maintenance bylaws in each municipality. So having Implementing systems on a provincial level helps address equity across the province. Um, and the main weakness of this specific pathway is that there is there could be uncertainties in implementation of the alterations code, um, and then it may require more resourcing for municipal property inspectors. So pathway two involves changing the Residential Tenancy Act to include wording on minimum and maximum interior temperatures um, and include prescriptive requirements for air filtration. Um, this puts the responsibility of providing these systems on the landlord. So the strengths, again, there's a blanket equity through the province and that there are examples of potential clauses out there um, on how to integrate it into the Residential Tenancy Act. The main weaknesses is that in the short term, it may trigger energy inefficient behavior. So there may be installation of greenhouse gas intensive equipment in order to comply with the new standard. Um, it puts more burden on the residential tenancy board um, to deal with complaints. And it could cause an increase in greenhouse gas emissions if not, uh, if a timeline for implementation is not considered with care. So the last pathway um, is utility splitting, and this involves changes to the Residential Tenancy Act to include a performance-based utility responsibility scheme. So the scheme would mandate that for energy inefficient buildings, landlords have to pay utilities, and for energy efficient buildings, the responsibility, responsibility of utilities will be on tenants. So the main strength of this pathway is that it addresses the split incentive in a very concrete way. Uh, landlords are incentivized to make retrofit changes in order to save money. Um, and then in energy efficient homes, uh, tenants are still incentivized to make uh, energy efficiency habits part of their life. Um, but the weaknesses, there are a few weaknesses, one are that it requires a pre-existing energy scoring or labeling system. It does require a rethink with how energy is billed and working with utilities on how to implement this. And that it may not be a significant incentive with lower energy prices. 
So with all of this, these suggestions, there's still some future work to be done, doing a cost benefit analysis on the different pathways, evaluating mechanisms to fund the retrofit support program, and giving specific attention to how these recommendations and policy amendments will work. But regardless of what we do, at minimum, we need to make sure that information on rental housing is more transparent and accessible in order to ensure that everyone can have the same access to energy efficient and climate resilience information on their homes. Um, this will start to move forward towards increased equity in housing programs and policies and give tenants the ability to live in homes that are efficient, climate resilient and safe. Um, thank you, everyone. Um, that's my presentation, and this is what I'm proposing. <laughs> yeah.